Okay, so we are live now. So welcome again, Julia. It's always a nice pleasure. It's always nice to see you again since I already met in 2017. So um, today our food talk, it will be with Julia Soldati. She's an Italian designer in, in love with food. She's researching ways to blur the border, the border between food and design and to make them influence each other. Uh, her work is inspired by food and culture, and in particular by the culture um, in Italy, of course. Um, her design practice, uh, Julia used food as a tool to explore the relationship with our bodies and to push and to question our cultural beliefs, creating new culinary exper experiences and languages. Thank you one more time, Julia. The stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, really happy to to be here today and sharing my, my work with you guys. Um, yeah, you already made a small presentation uh, of who I am, but, uh, but yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Giulia Soldati, a designer. And uh, since um, uh, 2016, more or less, uh, I, I dived into the topic of food uh, through the lens a little bit of, of, uh, of design and see how these two topics could uh, kind of influence each other um, and I'm gonna show you some of my work today so maybe I'll share now the the screen uh, presentation I think you should be able now to yes we can see it yeah okay great um, yeah so um because I, it's always a bit difficult as a, as a designer or as a person working in the field of food, how to kind of design the, you know, your profession as well, because there are so many different terms uh, that we can use, eating designer, food designer. Uh, I mean, it, there are also a lot of meanings. Uh, so something I wanted to start with, it was a, it's a bit a question that I always um, pose myself, uh, while starting a new research or a new project. So what is food? Because um, you can also think for yourself, what is food for you? What does it mean for you? Uh, first thing, it's something that we have to deal with every day and more times uh, a day because we have to eat, we have to uh, nourish ourselves. Uh, we need energy and energy comes from food mainly. Um, food can be also a lot of other things, can be memories, can be, uh, pleasure can be, yeah, it can be a lot of things. So I think every time uh, we start uh, a project or an investigation, I think it's always important to kind of, uh, yeah, uh, define what in that moment food can represent. Uh, so I want to start with uh, sharing with you a couple of projects that I'm actually um, are kind of the latest project uh, I've done. Uh, so I will go to the beginning of my, of my profession a little bit later, uh, but because I think they represent a little bit, uh, the, um, a bit also the um, answers that I gave myself uh, also to this question or like what I feel like now I reached with, uh, uh, with, my, uh, with my profession. So one project is, um, is about bread. Uh, and I've been always researching around uh, the, the, the relationship that we as human have with, uh, with food in our cultures. And I've been always trying to uh, shorten the distance between food and ourselves and our bodies. And uh, in time, I kind of stepped into the topic of bread several times, and I really find it really interesting and meaningful because bread is essentially something super simple and easy and we can find it in almost every culture and it, it can also represent the uh, the base of our nourish nourishment I mean bread is basically what we need um, so I've been uh, doing a project uh, last summer in uh, south of Italy in Amasteria it was an art residency where I could uh, 
experiment with a communal oven that uh, that was there. Um, so it was an oven from the. Uh, Sorry, oh. Julia. I don't know. It's it is supposed to see anything, but we are not seeing your slides. No. Yeah, mm. they are frozen. Oh, uh, sorry. Let's try again. Can you see it now? Okay. No. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Think it. There's something wrong with the. Okay. Um. So I'll do like this. So yeah, that was the question I was posing, and <laughs> um, and yeah, the project I've been doing uh, last summer uh, in, a, in the south of Italy. So this was the communal oven, and the communal oven was part of this uh, rural um, um, living area uh, made like there were like different uh buildings that were used to um agricult agricultural purposes and also living uh, purposes uh among few families and uh, they also had this communal oven where the the community would gather together either every week or every a period of time to bake bread together because people didn't really have um ovens in their houses so they would um, so they would go there to gather and to create these kind of communal moments where to bake bread. So that oven actually wasn't used for at least a hundred years. So it was really nice and powerful to kind of try to get it alive to get, uh, again, uh, together with the other people that were there in that moment. So it really became, um, yeah, a moment where the, the act of, me baking and uh, putting the fire on again, uh, kind of recreated those moments of community. Uh, so in this case, uh, food and in, and in particularly bread, it's really the, uh, the symbol of community of what a community uh, is through the, the power of food. So I think it was, it's kind of, the, kind of the essence of also what I've been researching in the past year. So how, food can bring people together and recreate spaces or moments of togetherness as well. Uh, here I've been uh, using the, the stones of the of the masseria of this uh, uh, place uh, that actually are really built like the, those stones uh, are made uh, sorry are used to construct all the all the buildings there. Um, so I wanted to use them as a kind of uh, mold or like uh, yeah a, a way to shape uh, um, bread because every every culture actually has a lot of different shapes of bread there is flat bread and also yeah shapes that come from uh the uh, the process of of making it and the time that it requires if you see sourdough it also it, it has a meaning why it's made in a certain way or not uh, so i actually chose to to give the power uh to the place to shape uh a bread of the masseria that also will resemble the 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 importance of that place to create uh, um, uh, yeah, a sharing point uh, from, from the communities around or like artists coming from abroad. Uh, so I shaped different kinds of uh, type of bread of the masseria through these, uh, uh, thanks to these stones kind of making the, yeah, becoming the, the, a second oven. And, uh, and then in the end, uh, uh, the bread was placed on a, on a communal table in front of the oven. So there was really a nice moment of uh, sharing a dinner together. And also I decided to cook a dinner with uh, some ingredients that would come from the area, from producers, um, and just uh, throw them in the fire. So like the most direct way uh, to, uh, to cook an ingredient and to serve it directly on the table. Um, another project that uh, it's kind of following this line it was a bit before it was um, uh, two years ago in um, uh, in Peru in the Andes I had the opportunity to uh, to join a workshop uh, there um, where actually the the topic of fire came up again uh, so just to give a little bit of a context here we were on the Andes and uh, you can see in the picture there are uh, Different elements on the on the left side, you you can see this um, Inca uh, site. So it was uh, 
Uh, it was believed that it was the first, very first tryout of um, kind of structures for, agri for agriculture because you have those circles that go down in depth and temperature changes. And it was believed that also like you could grow different things. We're not sure that that's, uh, that's all about. Um, but next week, uh, a couple of few years ago, uh, Virgilio Martinez, one of the best chefs in the world, he has a restaurant in Lima, decided to open another restaurant here on the Andes because he was working on altitudes. And his idea was to uh, work together with the local communities that are there to, uh, to grow and to uh, give an experience to guests that will really represent that altitude and, then let, and that landscape. Uh, so we arrived there, like also uh, kind of um, trying to to see what what was the, um, uh, the like the experience was all about and how they they could actually uh, work together with uh, with local communities and so on. Um, so it was actually quite uh, quite great to see how they build up everything. But then um, we realized how you know you have an outside part where the local community communities live and produce food. And then you have an inside part where everything is staged in a restaurant. I mean, you probably know better than me how a restaurant in a way it has to be staged because you're offering an experience and you, uh, you, you have to filter it through, you know, the, uh, yeah, the, the purpose that you want to uh, achieve or you want to give to your guests. Uh, so we started learning about the local communities and, and their, um, uh, traditional way also of living, uh, which is basically outdoor. Uh, everything it's built uh, with uh, mud and clay, their houses as well. They basically uh, cultivate a lot of tubers uh, and they live from it. So basically their life is around agriculture uh, on the, in that area. And uh, we discovered how they they spend their day in the fields and that moment was actually when they were about to harvest so while they're harvesting we discovered about this uh, it's called watia it's like this temporary oven that they built in the you can see here the pictures that they build in the, in the fields while they are still harvesting so basically they use the, the the soil is really dry so they use those pieces of soil to build up um, this temporary uh, kiln that they then um, fire. And when it's really hot, they throw uh, in the, the tubers that are actually just collecting one meter away. Uh, and then they, they close it down so the heat stays inside and then they can continue work. And after like one hour, every, like the tubers are cooked. Um, and um, yeah, and then they, they can eat. So for them, it's really like also this cycle of everything is happening on, on like where like you are growing something that comes from the Pachamama which is the mother earth so they also believe in this cycle of uh yeah producing and then they're sharing and they're really thankful of what they they could harvest and then they're sharing it together also like they basically have nothing and they would always give us something um so it was really also amazing how the yeah they could really share a piece of food that for them it's basically <laughs> like the meal of the day um so it was really powerful so in the end we kind of try to work with them and to create a space that could maybe bridge those two realities that in the end are not really matching together like the uh, fine dining restaurant and local communities on the andes which live without electricity and what and running water you know so how they could meet in a certain point and and be together so we try to to create this in between space uh, in an outdoor space uh, where fire and the action of cooking and eating could could give them uh, we were talking about also staff meal why it cannot happen outside for example so how this moment could really become like a bridge moment between those two realities and again how the action of uh, food, um, yeah, food preparation and consumption could, could create uh, a community. And actually it's really uh, powerful also the fact that you are working with fire because 
now in our in our houses we don't i mean we have yeah we have the stove gas fire maybe but sometimes we also have uh, induction for example so we don't have the fire is not as present as in the past but it's super interesting how the power of fire actually also means nourishment because through fire like in the past you could create really a kinship in a household because you would gather around the uh, the fire to to cook but also to get warm so it was really the center of uh, of a community and now it's a bit shifting uh, yeah as a uh, as an element so how could we bring it back you know in this narrative of food preparation so that's why also i kind of wanted to start with those two projects because i kind of feel they are like really powerful elements that are getting to the kind of essence of what food can represent in a community and how through design you can shape it and bring it back into our narratives. Um, and then to jump back <laughs> where it all started, um, Contacto is uh, one of my first uh, project and it's actually an ongoing research. Uh, Contacto is a the word, it's, a, it's an Italian word and it means uh, physical contact mainly. Um, and uh, it is a, a culinary culture and an eating experience that I designed in 2016. It was part of my uh, master uh, graduation project. Uh, and then it became my, my, my practice as well. Uh, I was studying in, uh, in Eindhoven at the Design Academy. I was studying social design and back then I wasn't really focusing on the topic of food mainly yet, but um, I really uh, realized back then that food was really a powerful tool that I could use as a designer to, to raise questions or um, yeah, to, um, how to say, rediscuss some of the beliefs we have every day. I was studying in an international environment, so so many different food cultures as well. Everyone had something to say about how would you cook something, uh, or like, you know, you do it in a certain way, or you should do this or that. But also it was interesting how in the end we would all sit down around the table and meet and talk, and it would really be, I mean, probably you will know better than me. Uh, you just sit around the table and then everything starts. Uh, but it would also be interesting how people would bring, you know, their stories as well together with food. So that's why for me it was really interesting to to investigate how it is so present in our life. But at the same time, I had the feeling a few years back that we also get far away from what we eat every day. Do you, I don't know if you all know what you are eating all the time. Where does it come from? or what does it do to your body? Or, you know, what is the history of what you are uh, ingesting? Like how much energy or how many, how many hands did it touch before arriving to your, to your plate? So how can we actually get back to that? You know, how can we get closer to what we eat? So I actually started from small scale of my household, our households. And uh, I thought that the moment of eating is actually the most, powerful <laughs> moment that we have because we do it uh, every time. Um, and from a Western European um, perspective, what I have in front every day is a plate, cutleries, and uh, what I also was a bit uh, sometimes frustrated about is that you go to supermarkets and everything is wrapped in plastic. Uh, sometimes things are already pre-made and you don't really have to touch them before preparing them or eating them. So there is a lot of space, let's say, between what we eat and our body. So how can we remove that? So in a way, I kind of decided that I wanted to try to remove everything, you know? No, uh, I didn't want any distance between our food and ourselves. So if we are eating, let's just eat with our hands because if you think about that, our hands are already uh, tool, tools for eating because we can kind of move them, you can direct them, you can pick stuff, you can break stuff, um, they can hold something. 
Um, so why not start from there? And if we really need something else to help us uh, fulfilling this action, yeah, that's no problem. Let's let's have um, a tool for that. But in the end, I realized that we don't really need a tool for eating because our hands can can do that. So I created Contactor, and uh, what I did was to uh, start like. I started not from an existing culture, let's say, because I didn't want to have any kind of reference uh, because I don't want to say that our culture is wrong or like another culture is using other utensils or like or zero utensils and it's better than ours. I was just like trying to create something new. Uh, so I, I used, uh, I tried to use like hands as, uh, my inspiration, uh, like, yeah, I try to get inspired by the hands and see how I could imagine food to be placed on, on the hand. And also at the same time, starting from ingredients, how they could uh, be adapted to the hand. So I, I really uh, kind of draw and created this uh, different courses where all the food is being placed by someone to uh, the eater's uh, hands. Um, and um, I also wanted to get a bit more uh, into the like the, your present while you're eating. So you also have to make, um, um, as you say, like you have to finish kind of you know the the yeah the, with a movement the course that you're about to eat. So you're also active in the sense of finishing up. Uh, completing uh, a course before eating it. Uh, so in every course, there is always a position of the hand and an action and a gestures of how to eat it. Uh, I created a manual as well with etiquette, for example, because if you don't have um, plates or cutleries at the table, then of course you have other rules, let's say, if you want to call them like this. So for example, something can spill on the table, uh, you are more active because you're using your hands and so on. Um, so then I've been investigating gestures and almost like getting as precise as uh, for, a, for example, theatrical choreography. Uh, so really like designing the, the specific actions and gestures. And uh, the, usually the, um, the experience uh, starts with a ritual as well of washing our hands uh, as a kind of moment where you all do the same action together and you also put attention on the tools that you are, are about to use. And then uh, usually I would guide the guest into uh, the courses that are seven, eight, something like this and explaining that every, every course has different um, uh, gestures and also different sensations, because uh, let's not forget that hands are tool for eat, tools for eating, but also tools for uh, understanding what is around us. Um, so imagine that you're eating with your, with, uh, with your calories, you see what it's uh, on your plate, you can see, uh, you, can, you can imagine, for example, the temperature or the consistency but if something comes to you directly in contact with your skin, then you can already uh, understand the temperature, the texture, the, the weight, and, and so on. So you're in a way already tasting through the sense of touch, what you're about to then bring into your mouth. So the idea was really to give a lot of uh, new information and to extend uh, yeah, the sense of, taste to the sense of touch. So in a way, you are experiencing food in, in a really complete way. So for example, in this case, I was uh, playing with uh, uh, warm and cold ingredients because the wrist is really uh, sensible to, uh, sensitive uh, to that. For example, uh, mothers are checking the temperature of the milk for the kids on the wrist usually. So that was kind of inspiration or I created a, a kind of a pasta for, for the hand because I didn't want to kind of adapt everything to the hand, but for me, the hand then became also uh, the starting point to designing something new. So why uh, we cannot design a, a format of, of pasta, this is kind of an open raviolo that can adapt to a certain position of the hand. And in this case, 
the gesture is just like to bring it to your mouth because if you feel, if you put your tongue uh, just under it then it will close automatically in your mouth so how can everything be so specific and be designed around the hand uh, so yeah also the gestures at the table will change and so on uh, so yeah this is kind of what you would usually have uh, after a meal with cutleries and, uh, and and plates. So I was also interesting of what's happening uh, if you don't have that, but you still have all those movements around the table. So uh, even though we think that being around the table is just, yeah, because we have to eat and uh, how do you say, relate to each other at the same time we, I don't know, I'm really interested in those, movements that happen around the table and the way we we interact with food and and things that are uh, there um, for this reason also i've been looking into in this case into the italian uh, uh, food cultures uh, i mean for me it's a bit easy also to start from there because it's something i know uh, not because i think it's uh, it's the best uh, uh, culture in the world it's just i know about it and for me, uh, for example, the spaghetti are always have been linked to, to the fork because I, uh, yeah, just works well, just to wear spaghetti around the fork. But then when I, while I was researching about eating tools for contact experience, even though I kind of kicked them out, um, I came across the history of the fork, which is uh, surprisingly, surprisingly quite, um, uh, quite recent because the fork uh, started appearing in our uh, daily lives, let's say, in, in, uh, in, the, in the houses around the 18th centuries. Um, while actually the, the spaghetti were already being produced um, in the 17th century in Naples. So those images that you're seeing now uh, are called, uh, the people you see in the images are called uh, macaroni eaters, mangia macaroni. Uh, and there were normal people in, in the Naples of the 17th century uh, that they were producing uh, pasta already and uh, they were consuming it directly on the street. So in a way it was already a kind of a street food, um, but then there was no fork yet. So uh, it was really interesting how they would just after, uh, because basically they were producing the spaghetti, putting it on those, uh, wooden structures uh, on the street to, to make it dry. And then they were cooking it. And then the, the, it was interesting to read some articles also of, because back then there was, in that moment, there was the start of the, uh, the grand tour through Europe. So uh, rich people, they could do that. They would travel around what is now Europe and uh, they would write their diaries, for example, and. Uh, we could still read the, uh, that they would be super surprised about how uh, people in Naples could just twirl spaghetti around their fingers, like the dexterity that they had, while they would be like, how am I going to do that? Um, so I really found interesting also the fact that we are used, uh, we're used to some gestures now, or, you know, your body is not used to something, but doesn't mean that it's wrong or that we cannot uh, design something around it. Um, so I created also an eating experience around this um, that, yeah, of course, like I, I called uh, Mangia Maccheroni. And the idea was really to uh, give people the freedom to ex explore um, how they could eat spaghetti. So the idea was to have just spaghetti with tomato sauce on a table with no cutlery, no uh, plates, and actually also no instructions. Because uh, usually with contact experience, everything is it's quite uh, curated in a way. Everything is designed to be in a certain way because it's it's precise. I want to give you a precise um, um, sensation. But here it's more about the exploration of being in a way together and then exploring together how to eat with your hands. So I just put a row of spaghetti on the table and people would just yeah, in, in a way, <laughs> find their own way to, uh, to eat with their bare hands. And it was really nice because you always uh, see a bit of, uh, you know, people are a bit skeptical at the beginning or afraid or, oh my God, I'm gonna make everything dirty. Um, 
but then when you kind of push that, um, I don't know, limit away, then you really enjoy and discover something that you've never done before, maybe. Uh, so it was really interesting. And also for me, it's always like a question that is always super interesting is what is dirt in relation to food? Why our perception sometimes tells us that eating with our hands is dirty. So why, what is that? So it's always interesting to kind of pose that question to people when they're like, no, I don't want to do that. Um, and um, yeah, another one uh, that I, uh, like another experience that I created and I actually always like to, to do before my dinners or experience, it's, um, it's a scarpetta, so it's an Italian word, and we use it uh, to, def like, to define this gesture that we do usually at the end of the meal with a piece of bread. So you basically scoop from the, from the plate uh, whatever is left. And in my opinion, it's the best bite because it's like the juicy remainings. Um, but somehow it was always a little bit um, unpolite, or I don't know, it's, it wasn't super fine to do it, so in particular in restaurants or... I don't know. I don't. I really can't explain why it's not uh, was not a good manner to do. Um, I mean, now restaurants are a bit more open about that, so they always give you actually bread. Now there is uh, a lot about bread and oil and so on. But I also have the feeling that they give you like a piece of bread and then a really defined uh, sauce, or you know, that you just do one time like this and that's it. It's not like you really go into it. So it was uh, also in this case a bit of a uh, way to kind of give importance to this um, action and gestures that come from just the freedom of being at the table and eat. Uh, and then instead of having it at the end of the, of the meal, I wanted to have it at the beginning also. In a way, the fact that you're using bread for it, it's also a bit uh, symbolic, if you want. Um, uh, can be even a bit religious, you know, sharing bread. Don't want to go into that, but, you know, it can have a lot of symbolism. Uh, so usually I yeah I would just place some olive oil, some some salt, pepper, herbs, and bread, so people can just really share it and move freely in on the table um, to to eat and to start the 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 experience like this. I I, I usually use the the table as a surface to um, to serve food, uh, as you maybe already understood because I think it's a uh, it's really ne neutral you don't have any uh, implements you know you don't have any anything that can give you like a limit in a way and um, yeah this one was actually kind of the same idea uh, I presented it in uh, at the des uh, design week in uh, Eindhoven uh, just before COVID actually uh, because the, I was asked to uh, participate to uh, an exhibition that was called The Object is Absent. And I was already removing a lot of objects from the action of eating. So they thought uh, it would be interesting to also have my project there. Uh, but while we were discussing how to present it, we, we even imagined uh, then why should we have a table? The table is also an object. So it was really interesting to present something on the floor because uh, I've also been uh, looking around the, the table itself um, and a lot of culture actually, they, um, they don't use tables really to prepare food or to cook or to, or to eat. Uh, there is this um, squatting position that we actually don't have anymore in, in the Western culture because we're used to sit on a chair at a table, but the squatting position is actually perfect to do a lot of things you can uh, cut, you can prepare, you can cook if you have like a fire, for example, that is on the on the floor level, and then you can consume food sitting on the on the on the ground. But what happened in between? Uh, culture basically came in. Uh, for example, uh, I've been speaking with a, uh, with a friend, for example, from India, and for her it's really uh, it's really present the fact that the the English um, 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 colonization when came in actually brought everything with it you know all the objects all the culture it brought chairs and tables and cutleries so there are restaurants where you have cutleries in India and 
at the restaurants that you that you don't. So it's uh, I don't know. It's uh, always super interesting how also our perception. It's uh, basically the uh, the way you define that something is wrong or right. So in this case, the discussion was about is it dirty to to eat it from the floor? It's not really on the floor anyway because I had uh, a surface. But also to see people if they were um, uh, how to say um, willing to kind of squat uh, with me and have a conversation about that. So I think it was really a nice moment to opening opening up this uh, this conversation. Um, another <clears throat> project that um, it's kind of following this uh, this line of um, eating by hand and creating a communal moment around the table is Alamano. It is a project that I um, that I created together with a chef Tomaso Buresti and we presented it um, in 2018 and 19 in Amsterdam uh, uh, at Mediamatic. It's an art center and also a restaurant. And they started a, a program called Neo Futuristic Dinner. So uh, we proposed this as a as a neo futuristic dinner. So kind of going back instead of <laughs> uh, forward. Uh, the idea was to have uh, six or seven courses that were uh, based on the senses and on the action of eating by hand. Uh, so for example, in this first picture, you, you see like a welcome cocktail, with, uh, which is uh, not served in, in a glass, but is an ice cube. And so you already have this super immediate cold um, uh, sensation to start the dinner with. And for example, after that, uh, I created these ceramics uh, to hold um, a soup, not a yeah, broth. So after the cold, then you have the warmth directly in your hand. Uh, the idea is that these bowls are not um, kind of able to stand on the table properly, but you have to hold them. And the idea is also that uh, the temperature will, will um, pass through the, through the ceramics. And, uh, and again, we repropose the, uh, the uh, the image of the mangia macaroni that I uh, showed you before. So we were pouring in this case, uh, that was a bit, this was a bit more um, performative. We decided that we wanted to also bring to the table the action of finishing um, a course. So we were pouring the, the sauce on top of the spaghetti. Um, and then, yeah, you could see people uh, enjoying it. And also the idea to have um herbs hanging from the ceiling so also the gestures that usually is quite kind of horizontal you know like the um drawings i showed you before and here you kind of also go vertical so how to uh, switch a little bit that as well you know instead of just having these movements you also have towards the uh yeah the verticality and then we created other objects where you have to kind of find uh, maybe uh, ingredients that are hidden. Uh, so like kind of scooping with your fingers and then mix things together um, or like, yeah, creating like rice bowls, for example, we're inspired of how you create a rice bowl. So in this case, how you can actually just do it at the table, including the ingredients that are already cooked uh, or like how smell, uh, can can become part of it and you can break stuff as well. Um, so in this case, you would maybe uh, spray, uh, I think it was, uh, I don't remember which kind of alcohol, maybe rum or, or something on top of your dessert. Uh, so yeah, always like this uh, mix of actions and, uh, and interactions at, uh, at the table. Mm. Uh, that was the first edition, then we uh, came back to Amsterdam for a second edition, which was, in my opinion, even better designed because we had more time to uh, design every course. And we were uh, imag uh, not imagining, we were proposing also courses really related to uh, producers uh, in the area. And for example, here was a, a mix of uh, yeah, leaves uh, coming from the aquaponic that they have. So we also kind of used uh, the dinner to tell a lot of stories. So uh, it's not just about getting closer to food through um, 
you, like by using hands and no uh, objects or no utensils, but it's also like, how can you uh, deliver stories through and emotions, you know, intense emotion, then you're gonna kind of um, experience that even more. How can you tell stories about where food comes from, people involved and so on. So yeah, this was the, the idea that you would kind of pick leaves the same way we would pick them in the garden and then you would create your own uh, uh, bouquet of, of leaves and uh, kind of a salad. Uh, then again with uh, sauces and uh, things around. Uh, this also was another course that was interesting because I, I wanted to bring something that happens usually in the kitchen directly on the table. Um, I believe that the, the, the making, when you make uh, fresh pasta and you roll the ravioli, you kind of fold them and cut them. It's really a nice uh, ritual also when sometimes you also do it together before a dinner or so on, uh, but it stays in the kitchen. You know, if some people, if people come to, to have dinner, then they, they completely miss that part. So how we could bring it to the table. So we managed to, to cook those long sheets of uh, fresh pasta and we would ask people to fill them and to cut, uh, fold them and cut them directly at the table. So actually it was really uh, interesting and nice how everyone was kind of making their own ravioli. And then they weren't even ravioli anymore because of course the shape is not that, but that's, I think wasn't actually the point. So it was really nice to see people playing with, the, with that movement that usually are just um, in the kitchen. Uh, after those two dinners, actually we, uh, me and Tommaso, the chef, we, uh, uh, we took the, uh, what do you say, the, we took the kitchen of Mediamatic, we started working there and uh, proposing what we've done in those dinners, trying to propose it in a restaurant, like um, not like just for one event. So how can you ask people to, if they want to use their hands in a, in a normal restaurant where they don't really want to maybe listen to all your stories about how you should maybe use your hands for eating. So it was an interesting um, challenge where we would still not use plate, but wooden boards and maybe just sometimes one spoon or chopsticks. So how we could play with uh, utensils and still uh, ask people to pick something with their hands or do some actions. So we tried to, yeah, to do that and it was really, I think, fun. Uh, I don't know if it's, uh, you can do it in a restaurant with not a lot of, uh, to say, not budget, but you know, it's, yeah, a low key restaurant, but it was nice to, to kind of tell people, okay, if you want, you can fill your own pasta with your hands or if you don't, those are the chopsticks or this is, uh, oh, sorry, the image. Um, this is the spoon or like how we could create something that you would break. This, is, this was uh, uh, a whole mushroom uh, that you would kind of tear apart. So uh, again, like we were trying to propose stuff that would create a little bit of uh, more action at the table than a static plate. And in that moment also Corona hit. So we had to kind of reinvent uh, things. And I think we were lucky because we had an amazing location and this location had uh, greenhouses already in the water side, those little greenhouse. Um, and during yeah, the months that we were closed, we were like, yeah, how we should um, open again, how can we and so on. And somehow uh, it came up. Yeah, let's try to put a table in the greenhouse. It's for two people. Maybe you can eat there and then you're separate uh, from, uh, from everyone else. So this is how Sarasipari started with the team that was back then working at Mediamatic. We posted a picture, probably this one, I don't know, on Instagram and uh, yeah, Amsterdam went crazy. Everyone, they, the morning after at nine o'clock was calling to book a table of something that didn't exist yet. Uh, but probably the, like everyone saw the potential of it because it was a really dark moment. I mean, we all know it, uh, where there was no kind of perspective of anything. And this was a way of still trying to celebrate something that you could still do instead of saying what you cannot do, because that's all, 
was all we could hear. Uh, so yeah, we created uh, an experience inside the greenhouses where two people could still share because anyway, you would have to go with your partner or uh, the person you're living with or a close friend and so on. So we still use those wooden boards that I showed you before uh, from the restaurant, but they were longer. So the whole service was uh, studied and designed uh, in the way that you would not enter the, the greenhouse. So everything was coming from outside. So those long wooden boards would come from outside. So people that would uh, eat inside, you would really feel uh, kind of safe. And uh, yeah, no one would intrude your space. So we're playing with the, like also with nice shared food and so on. And it was really, a, I think a good test uh, to celebrate the fact that two people could still uh, share a moment, a dinner and food together. Um, yeah, here I wanted to quickly also show you a work in progress that I, uh, a project I'm working on at the moment in a way that, uh, yeah, food can be a, like a lot of different things and can tell a lot of different stories. Uh, so I've, I've been asked to, to work on a wrapped dinner, uh, focusing on the topic of the Mar de Plastico, uh, which is an area in Spain, Almeria, where um, uh, the most of uh, the vegetables that we uh, have in Europe uh, come from. And basically it's produced under those plastic uh, sheets. It's basically not even green, like real greenhouses. They're like those plastic tunnels where all the vegetables are grown. Uh, so I'm, I, I still don't know exactly what uh, the dinner is going to be about, but I think it will be interesting to kind of dive into how this wrapped uh, tunnel then can be translated on the table. So thinking of wrapped food uh, that you can kind of, um, ah yeah, this is the, uh, the, the area called also the salad bowl of Europe. Uh, so how you can actually unwrap maybe story, those stories, because there is a lot going on there, of course, also uh, a lot of problems about who's working there and in which conditions. Um, and also we, are, we already have a lot of uh, wrapped food in different cultures, so how maybe I can use that for, uh, for this event. Uh, so yeah, the idea that you kind of, you can wrap something and then people will unwrap it. So yeah, I don't know, I just um, thought to show, to kind of share that as well uh, as a work in progress. And maybe, yeah, you can break stuff as a way to unwrap. Also breaking is quite an active um, action. And uh, yeah, maybe also creating tools for that. Uh, I usually create ceramics and uh, yeah, tableware, even though I don't really like to call it like this. Uh, to kind of support the eating experiences, but never really resembling uh, plates, uh, more like those are more like utensils that can help or yeah, eating or serving food. And uh, uh, yeah, and on the line of objects, those, this also was one, one of my first projects together with Contacto, they were kind of following the same line. Uh, so really at the beginning of, uh, um, of my research, um, how, how can you get closer to, to food while, for example, preparing food uh, in your house? Um, so I, so these are, are kind of a bit of provocative uh, objects. Maybe they're not really functional 100%. Uh, so I, I, again, there I was like, okay, our hands can be tools. Uh, but for preparing food, you actually have to be quite precise for a certain actions. So there I would really just focus on what is missing to fulfill the that action. So for example, in this case, it's a whisk. The idea is that it's really an extension of your body because you can, you know, you can still move like this as a food processor maybe, but you, to whisk uh, the, the eggs, uh, for example, you need to incorporate air and your finger are a bit not good for that. So why? cannot we have almost an uh, extension, you know, that will fulfill that action. So yeah, this was a bit provocative, but the idea was that by doing that, you're using your body, you see the energy also that you can put into an, um, a preparation of food. And at the same time, you're kind of forced to 
make your hands dirty because with all those tool, tools, you will really make your hands dirty. So this was a fish scaler. Also like, you know, studying volumes that would follow, for example, the body. This was a juicer. So it's really in your hands and the lemon is or, or whatever. It's in the other hand. So it's basically just going through your fingers. Um, so, yeah. And uh, yeah, just uh, kind of to, to conclude, I wanted to, uh, yeah, just to also show that food is a lot of things and there are a lot of scales, like small scale and a bigger scale, and they kind of all hide behind a morsel of food that we ingest every day. So another research that I, it's quite ongoing, I, I like to, to, to start was to follow the production of certain food and see how much maybe human gestures are still needed. So for example, this is a cheese factory in the outskirts of Milan. And I like to see how people would still do some actions together with machines or, um, yeah, I went to see like, for example, uh, this is a, it was like a salami, uh, small uh, producers uh, and how much can it be small? Or this was a cheese production. So also like time, how time would come in uh, or like bread, you know, all the, yeah, the aspects of our diet as well. And this was the um, uh, big fish market in Milan. So basically the, the whole fish that will go through Italy and maybe other countries as well would fly there and then would be divided <laughs> into other, uh, yeah. So a lot of uh, information as well, which sometimes is also nice just to collect. And uh, this was another, um, on this kind of line of food production it was a project that I uh, did during the biennial, design biennial in Ljubljana, in Slovenia, uh, a few years ago. Together with a group of people, we were investigating the countryside and uh, how actually countryside is, sometimes we believe that it's nature. We feel like, oh yeah, let's have a walk in the countryside. So much nature, but it's actually, a uh, man-made nature and it's super constructed because it's about agriculture and sometimes we don't see it but there is a lot of information already there where I, I grew up in the outskirts of Milan it's countryside everything is cornfields basically or wheat uh, and it's like oh nice we have cornfields but then you realize that it's about feeding the cows to produce milk and or you have already that in your in your landscape, but if you don't think about it, you just walk around. Um, yeah, a nice landscape, maybe I don't know. Uh, so here we wanted to kind of highlight those informations of the countryside. So those volumes, for example, would tell uh, the the volume of uh, uh, land that you would need to create one recipe. Uh, so every color had the uh, you could read like the information, every color was on one ingredient. So the pink one, for example, was the meat. So it was the bigger part, or like in this case, uh, the amount of water needed to grow one kilo of potato or one kilo of corn. So like really like having like those information in volumes inside the, uh, the countryside where you actually then see uh, those uh, things growing. Uh, or this was the energy needed for, um, I don't remember which specific uh, ingredient, but you had uh, the, the brown part was like the uh, machinery energy, the other one was fuel. Uh, and the, there is a tiny line that is a pink one, is a human uh, energy, which is like really little because all the energy you need doesn't mostly come from us. You take it from somewhere else. So yeah, I think I'm kind of, done just yeah it was just like also a way to wrap up the fact that uh, I use food to create storytelling and I like to create dinners and eating experiences because then it's a really an uh, active moment for who is uh, participating to kind of really uh, ingest in a way the information and also maybe reconsider the relationship we have with food every day but there are a lot of 
layers as well that are hidden uh, behind, the, the, yeah, behind the topic of food. And uh, me as a designer, other designers as well, I think we all have those uh, different uh, way of kind of tackling the topic. And it's interesting to see the diversity of it and uh, yeah, how much actually we can tell about. And yeah, I think that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> Okay, Julia, thank you so much for your presentation. It was very inspirational, our relation with food, relationship with food. There is anyone who has some questions for Julia? Francisca? So no one has questions. <laughs> Okay, Julia, so once more, thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah, thank it you. It was for the pleasure to see, you, to see you again here. Um, I don't know, this year we'll have eFood again um, in Lisbon. Hope to see you there online, maybe. Yeah. We don't know. Yeah, hopefully we can uh, all be physically there, but otherwise, yeah. online will be great. Okay, so Julia, thank you very much and yeah, thank talk you. to you soon. Okay, yeah, thank Bye. you. Thank you.